Could I ask you please to stand in honor of the academic procession? It is my pleasure to invite the graduating students of the 2017 class to take their places. Professor Eyal Scheiner, Vice Dean of Student Affairs, Faculty of Health Sciences. <laughs> Professor Limor Aronson Daniel, Vice Rector for International Academic Affairs. <laughs> Professor Mark Clarfield, Director of the Medical School for International Health. And now the president of Ben Gurion University, Professor Rifka Karmi. Followed by the procession of our dear students. Please be seated. One short reminder before we begin, please switch off cell phones so that there are no interruptions. Distinguished guests, faculty members, students, families and friends, thank you all for honouring us with your presence and a special welcome to those joining us through our webcast, our cameras over here. I've been asked to pass on the following message from Dr. Quittel, Dr. Deckelbaum, Jeanette, Kelly, Beth and Victoria from our New York office. Congratulations on a job well done. Congratulations to your families who have supported and guided you. We're so proud of you and know you will all contribute to your chosen fields and be a credit to MSIH. Please keep in touch and remember you always have an MSIH home in New York. Thank you, our New York team. Earlier today, Professor Mark Clarfield asked me to give him a few moments to settle in before I introduced him. So, Mark, are you ready? <laughs> I guess I fell up the stairs. <laughs> okay, Professor Mark Clarfield. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. It gives new, new meaning to tripping up the stairs. Uh, President Carmi, Vice Rector Aronson Daniel, Vice Dean Shiner, Honored faculty, our staff both here and, where's the camera? Right, New York. Dr. Charles Larson, our guest, where is he? His wife, Frances Abood. Guests, family, above all, you guys, the class of 2017. First of all, Mazal Tov, congratulations. I will only take the two minutes that have been allotted to me by uh, uh, Mike and Leora, but I just want to use one word to describe what I see in you as individuals and as a group, and that word is resilience which I think characterizes you all. And since I didn't know what the word meant, I looked it up. <laughs> and I looked in the Oxford Dictionary, and it says two, it is two definitions. This is a multiple choice. Where's David? NBME exam. Okay, number one, the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape or elasticity. Or two, the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or toughness. I think that's you. Number two, why do I say this? I have seven reasons. Uh, first of all, you not only got through medical school, which is no easy task for anybody, but for all of you, you did this in a foreign country, 
For most of you, you did it in a new language. For many of you, it was a new culture. For all of us, we got through an interesting security event in the summer of 2014 together. Uh, for all the Americans among you who took federal student loans, we had a bit of a desert there for a bit. We solved it. And for all of us, we have a global health curriculum that we uh, put on top of the usual curriculum that other medical students have. We didn't, we didn't leave anything out, but we, that was added. And to deal with that, it's uh, extra. And finally, your global health clerkship was an interesting example for many of you of resilience. Some of you started in Ethiopia, moved to the Philippines, popped into Sri Lanka for a few weeks, and then landed in Nepal. And you did it with humor, and you, you did it with resilience, and you did it, I was really impressed. But here you are today, <laughs> looking young, vibrant, happy, and accomplished, and of course, resilient. So leave MSAH with your degree, go away from Beersheba, spread your wings, become the very, very best doctors you can be, and my, have, I have only one request, don't forget us. Join the Alumni Association and stay on with us. And I'm really looking forward to this evening. This is really a lot of fun, and I, I'm really looking forward to it for your sake and for all of us. Mazal tov. Now, what I normally forget to do, I'm so excited, is to introduce the next guest, but I didn't forget this time. And it's Professor Rivka Karmi, the president of our fine university. who I know this sounds like a truism, but, it, but it's true. And that is, she really is a wonderful friend of this medical school. She's not only a great president, she does a wonderful job, this is a fine university, but really, uh, her heart has always been with this medical school, first when she was a faculty member, next when she was dean, and now that she's president. So I'm really delighted that she could be here with us, and I know her heart is with us all tonight. Professor Carmi. Thanks so much, Professor Clarfield, Mark. Vice Rector, Limo Aronson. Vice Dean, Professor Yal Scheiner, my student. I never failed to mention that. <laughs> Our distinguished um, guest speaker, Professor Larson. Obviously, Professor Clarfield, now uh, in a very formal way. Professor Glick, Professor Jutkovic. Dear families uh, both here and abroad, future students watching us uh, now on the internet, I'm sure there are many of them, faculty and students, dear guests, and last but not least, our very dear graduates, my young colleagues. Good evening and welcome. The graduation ceremony of the Medical School for International Health is one of the most exciting annual events at this institution, and specifically for me, uh, on a personal level, as you already heard. I have had the good luck and immense privilege to witness the development of the school from idea to implementation. I was also teaching human genetics at the school for quite some years, even when I served as the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, the academic home of this program. My only regret is that uh, since I no longer teach, I do not uh, have the pleasure of knowing you personally. So as I noted before, I was uh, very fortunate to be a partner in this exciting journey that began almost 10, 20 years ago to implement a novel project in medical education by creating an MD program in international medicine and health. This endeavor was the first in its kind in the world and is still a unique and innovative educational model for teaching medicine in the era of globalization of the 21st century. Globalization has been a major goal of all universities in the world. The number of foreign students on campuses has become a central factor in ranking of universities. It has also contributed nicely to shrinking budgets of universities and colleges. But not too many universities have managed to create sustainable, active, and vibrant academic collaborations that involve, as in the case of MSIH, throughout the admission process, the teaching program, the clinical clerkship, evaluation, and more, thus making science and teaching really global and boundless. Many dedicated faculty members and administrative staff have and continue to put their hearts and souls 
it into this important endeavor, and we are obviously grateful to all of them. However, it is to you, my dear graduates, that we all may be the largest part of the continuous growth and development of this special program. This program has now gained an international reputation in the world of medical education. You came here with a strong desire to make a difference, knowing the great adjustment you would need to do yourself. Your personal experiences in a different culture and challenging environment have undoubtedly played a major role in your international and intercultural education and training. Global health is indeed about understanding the problems and needs of the other, and often the underprivileged, poor and weak. But it is also about accepting, appreciating, respecting other cultures, different attitudes, strange beliefs. But isn't that, in fact, what medicine is all about? In an opinion article named Doctor, Shut Up and Listen, that appeared in the New York Times a couple of years ago, Nirmal Droshi describes a program initiated in a large urban hospital in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The author cited figures taken from various studies on patient satisfaction. It was found that communication failure was at the root of over 70% of serious adverse health outcome in hospitals. Two out of every three patients were discharged from the hospital without even knowing their diagnosis. In over 60% of cases, patients misunderstood directions after a visit to the doctor's office. On the average, physicians wait, uh, wait just 18 seconds before interrupting the patient's narrative of their symptoms. As expected, the project that was designed to address these issues was highly successful as measured by a remarkable improvement of the hospital's score on national patient satisfaction ranking. This is extremely important as the finding of several previous studies showed that there is a clear correlation between higher patient satisfaction scores and better health outcomes. Straightforward and simple, yet not obvious at all. The world of medicine is rapidly changing, highly specialized, globally expanding, technologically advancing. Global and regional political and social changes are bringing about health and medicine challenges related to immigration and refugee status. Medical schools need to address all of this, but never lose sight of what is most important, the patient. As asserted by Dr. Brian Neese, graduate of, of our MSAH in his book, Living and Dying in the Fourth Year, the vision of the founders of this school has given wings to people that see the patients as their prime professional obligation and commitment. Today, dear graduate, you are officially joining the medical profession that more than anything is a way of life and a lifelong commitment. You are also joining a growing body of alumni, agents of our own mission here at Ben-Gurion University to bring science and health from the Negev to the world in order to improve the lives of individuals and communities. We know that you will be proud of your alma mater as much as we are proud of your accomplishments and achievements and inspired by your insights and contributions. I would like to take this opportunity to specially thank your families who supported you uh, as you bravely pursued your goals. I truly appreciate and admire their spirit and courage, and I feel that they deserve a very big applause. Please give them a hand. The renowned physician William Osler once said, as physicians, we should strive to cure a few, help most, but comfort all. I wish you, my young colleagues, good health, good luck, success and satisfaction, and may you help curing most and comforting all wherever you go. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Carmi. I would like to invite Professor Limor Aronson Daniel to address the audience.
Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Professor Carmi, President of BGU, Professor Eyal Shiner, Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, Professor Mark Clarfield, Program Director, uh, Professor Larson, Professor of Pediatrics from the University of McGill, faculty, staff, students, new graduates, families from near and afar, uh, Professor Glick, Professor Judkovic, and distinguished guests, good evening. It is a great honor and a great pleasure for me to stand here in Be'er Sheva and congratulate you on this graduation ceremony at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. Albert Einstein once said that the human being is part of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space, a part that experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this pr prison by widening our circle of compassion, to embrace all living creatures and the whole of the nature in its beauty. This was Albert Einstein. Dear graduates, soon to be medical doctors, you made a choice at quite an early point in your life to widen your circle of compassion. We did our utmost in the past four years to provide you with the tools to best fulfill your mission for life. On behalf of Ben Gurion University of the Negev, I wish you success, satisfaction, gratification. I hope you enjoy uh, what you do in the future. Please remember that we are your home wherever you are in the future. Do well and be well. Shalom and litaot. Thank you, Professor Aronson Daniel. Uh, it's my pleasure now to invite the Vice Dean for Students Affairs, Faculty of Health Sciences, Professor Eyal Scheiner, to address the audience. Good afternoon, our distinguished guest, our guest of honor, Professor Charles Larson, Professor Rifka Karmi, my beloved teacher, <laughs> uh, Professor Clarkfield, uh, Professor Limor Aronson, uh, faculty members, uh, Professor Glick was my dean when I started learning here in Be'er Sheva, Professor Djakovic, families here in the board, and lastly, but actually first and foremost, our 34 graduates of our Medical School for International Health. As Vice Dean for Student Affairs, I have the honor of replacing our dean, Professor Amos Katz, who asked me to congratulate our new graduates and to extend his apologies for not being able to attend this meaningful ceremony. I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Clarkfield and all those who contribute to labor so intensively and with enormous dedication for the success of this school. On this special day of our graduation, I am sure that each one of you is feeling great sense of achievement and pride and that your experiences in Israel, mostly good but some bad, will serve you in the future. I am well aware that studying a abroad, far away from your family and close friends, was not all smooth sailing. You had to learn to function in a foreign multicultural society where patients speak other languages, not English, Hebrew, Arabic, Russian, uh, and living in a city which we adore, but it's in many ways isolated from the center of the country and the cultural highlights. I am sure that the many difficulties you overcame have in many ways enriched your life, broadened your horizons, and have endowed you with maturity and sense of achievement. We hope that all this and the wide medical knowledge you have attained during your four years at BGU will serve you in the future of becoming leaders of a new kind of medicine education that addresses the need for physicians who are sensitive to personal population needs as well as community issues. I wish you all good luck, good health, success, and satisfaction on entering today the wonderful world of medicine. I especially wish to thank your families who supported you in pursuing your goals. Their support and encouragement played an invaluable role during the most difficult period. We hope that each of you, each one of you, will act as an ambassador to promote global health and cross-cultural medicine, and that your Be'er Sheva experience will remain as a special period in your life. 
May you continue to be blessed and that the skills you have learned at BGU will serve you and guide you in the future. Later out. Thank you, Professor Shiner. It now gives me great pleasure to invite soon-to-be doctor Aaron Herzog to play Tchaikovsky's Chant de Parole and Romance.
Thank you, Aaron. I'd like to call upon Professor Mark Claffield to introduce our distinguished guest of honour, Professor Charles Larson. Just to let you know that Aaron doesn't just play classical piano, but he and I and a couple of our mates in this class did some mean rocking about a month ago. And I sort of had a thought maybe we should bring the band up again today, but I was overruled as usual has to be some responsible adult has to run this medical school. So before I introduce uh, Professor Larson, I just want to recognize two people in the audience. Could our uh, guests from Ethiopia please stand up, the two students, to stand up for a sec? I introduce you to them because I think it shows a, a, an angle of our school. Not only do we teach our medical students, we bring people from abroad to learn with them. These two gentlemen are scholarship students from Ethiopia who spent about three months here together with our students and others. And uh, it's really a pleasure to have you here. And we thank the donors for uh, enabling you to come here. And also, I bring up Ethiopia because you'll hear in a minute about our, our guest speaker has had a lot of experience in that country. And today, I understand that the World Health Organization uh, nominated its new head. And he's a physician from Ethiopia, Dr. Tedros Adhanon. So we have a lot of connections with Ethiopia, and we hope to continue them. So uh, our guest, it really is a distinct pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Charles Larson, who completed his medical degree, <clears throat> as well as subsequent specializations in both pediatrics and public health at McGill University in La Belle Province, Quebec, in the beautiful province of Quebec. He's had broad experience in global health, and I'm only going to touch on a couple of things he's done. As far back as 1987, when he joined the McGill Ethiopia Community Health Project from 1987 to 92, not one to let grass grow under his feet, or tundra for that matter. He then led a five-year child health project in Chelyabinsk in uh, Russia, or the Soviet Union then? It was Russia. Okay. Continuing to indulge his wanderlust, he moved to Bangladesh in 2002, where he directed the International Center for Diarrheal Diseases Research. He got tired of traveling, returned to Montreal in 2015, where he assumed his current role as national coordinator of the Canadian Coalition for Global Health Research. I've never met someone with so many titles, so many places that have such long names, Charles, as you have directed. He's won many grants, awards, published in multiple articles in prestigious medical journals. We couldn't have a better speaker for the Medical School for International Health. On a personal note, I've known Charles since at least 1982, when I was actually a resident in his program in community medicine at McGill. I've always liked him, and uh, more importantly, I've admired him and respect him very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Charles Larson. Thank you, Mark.
President Carmi, Vice Rector Aronson, Vice Dean Shiner, um, I don't know if Professor Deckelbaum is looking, look, listening in, but welcome. welcome. And uh, honorable guests and faculty, uh, Tana Stalin, good afternoon. Uh, really is a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's truly an honor to have been asked to give this graduation talk to the 16th graduating class of the Ben-Gurion uh, Medical School for International Health. Uh, let me begin by congratulating uh, each of you in the class of 2017. You know, it's only moments from now that you're all going to be addressed as doctors. How does it feel? <laughs> Come on, how does it feel? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Great. You know, that's a designation you're going to be carrying with you for the rest of your lives. Wow, the rest of your lives. Uh, wear it well. Um, I think it goes without saying as well that uh, congratulations are in order for your parents who have obviously in many cases made great sacrifices to get you here to where you are today and I know that they're incredibly proud of you. So it was about six months ago that uh, Dr. Clarfield phoned me and, uh, you know, he's, I get, received this call and he's inviting me to give this graduation talk. You know, and I, I was really quite honored and immediately I consented to it. But then the next morning I woke up. <laughs> and for the next six months, <laughs> I've been trying to figure out what in the world am I going to say? It's quite a daunting uh, task to such a, an honorable class as yours. The more I've read about you, the more I know about you, the more impressed I become. Anyway, you know, um, as tradition would have it, um, you know, you get some gray haired, you know, somewhat over the hill fellow. You know, I really fit the bill, don't I? <laughs> Uh, you know, who's going to give an inspiring and life-altering talk, uh, most likely based on all the mistakes one has made over considerable years of a career in, in global health. Uh, all of which, in my case, I'm going to be delivering to you a young, energetic, talented graduating class with bright futures ahead of them, who I hardly even know. Uh, but I'm going to do my best to stay focused on the bright part today. Uh, so this is what I've decided to do. I want to share with you what is going to be five attributes which have really helped me throughout my career journey, and then tell you a story that illustrates some of the lessons I've learned over an admittedly very eclectic uh, career, but not unrepresentative of the incredible life experiences each of you can look forward to in your own, your own careers. So let's, let's start with a few attributes, and admittedly, some of these are quite overlapping. So the first one I want to mention is life outside of medicine. This one's pretty obvious, but we often underestimate the pull of medicine, you know, how consuming it can be. Uh, you know, to take on other challenges, whether through a project, uh, sports, music, carpentry, maybe all of the above. That's something that I think you really, you know, right, you want to stay focused on, on what you can do beyond having that life, that consuming life in medicine. Now, many, many of you think it's madness, but as a resident, I, brought that, I bought a broken down old farmhouse. It was about 200 years old, lousy shape, got it cheap. Uh, and on weekends, when I had time off, I'd drive out to what we call the uh, eastern townships in, in, in Quebec and become lost in another world. Tearing down walls, building furniture, fighting off mice, groundhogs, you name it. It's a project I continue to pursue to this very day. Uh, it has proven to be 
my way of creating and maintaining a balance between work, family, and, and personal growth. So go out there and find a life outside of medicine. Number two, anticipate uncertainty. Navigating yourself through medical schools required discipline and a high degree of predictability. Your schedules have been set, you know what's expected and you deal with it, and I expect you all are really pros at it. To varied degrees, your residency training is gonna be pretty much the same thing, but eventually, all that's gonna change, and you will have obvious options and opportunities to venture into the unknown, which I would urge all of you to embrace. Get out there and take a few risks. Don't wait until you're ready, because then you'll never be ready. And be ready to expect the unexpected. For those of you who decide part or all of your career will be in a country other than your own, which you've already accomplished in the past four years, you know, in, in, in particular, if you pursue either in part or whole a, a career in global health, uncertainty is going to be the norm, and demanding it to be otherwise will lead you to despair and anger. Don't let that happen. This doesn't mean you need to accept uncertainty, but just rather deal with it. You do this by setting realistic goals, anticipating the need for change in course, and identifying new opportunities. Let me move on to number three, and that's to be op optimistic. I might even say pathologically optimistic. It really helps. Uh, you're going to encounter disappointments, and they're going to be failures. Don't let them drag you down. Dream big, hold on, and hold on to a can-do attitude. For example, I firmly believe it will be your generation that leads the way to the end of the appalling health disparities that exist today in under-resourced, disadvantaged populations. You're the ones that are going to do it. It's going to be difficult with many determinants seemingly out of your control. Rational thinking may tell you this cannot be done. Nonetheless, hold on to the vision of what is possible not the impossible. Given nearly all of you enrolled here because of your interest in global health, let's just take a brief look at what such a career optimistically okay, has to offer. The challenges are huge, the demands daunting, and the rewards unmatched. Most of you who choose this path will work in anonymity. There aren't going to be any outstanding service awards as impactful as your work will be. But there will be rewards. And let's just consider a few. You will bear witness, for sure, to the devastating, you already have, to the just devastating impact of poverty and the lack of empowerment. But at the same time, you will have firsthand experience with the amazing strengths and talents found among the most disadvantaged Way, disadvantaged populations on this earth. One of the important roles will be, that you're going to have will be to communicate these experiences to us all. You're going to develop lifelong friendships and indiv with individuals from backgrounds quite distinct from yours. It will be an amazing learning opportunity, opening new worlds and enriching you immeasurably. And you're going to become create experts in the creation of partnerships and the skills required to make that happen. That's cultural sensitivity, humility, and relationships based on respect and equality. These are truly rewards to be cherished. Let's move on to the last two attributes I want to share with you. Find your best qualities. What you're best at, and what is most rewarding. Some of you may believe you've already figured that out. Maybe you have. But be open for surprises. The discovery of skills you will not necessarily have recognized until an opportunity to express them comes along. Of course, 
The corollary of this is to recognize what you're not very good at, and none of us are good at everything. Don't lock yourself into a pathway that leads to disappointment or feel of fear, fear of failure. This is very much about trusting yourself. What makes your day and creates the greatest sense of fulfillment? You know, it wasn't until my late 30s that I came to the conclusion that my academic career path in developmental pediatrics, while well, having its rewards, honestly was not making my day, not what I wanted to look back on towards the end of my career. So I made that decision to drop my university appointment. I entered into a preventive medicine and public health residency and a degree program in epidemiology with the aim of eventually working in low-income countries as a child health researcher and educator. And three years later, I found myself uh, in Ethiopia. And that was the start of my global health career, a decision I've never regretted, and a career path I found productive and immensely rewarding. So the bottom line, trust yourself, pursue what feels right, and be open to changing course. Last, number five, practicing the art of medicine. At its core, the practice of medicine is a combination of science and art. I expect this is a concept introduced to you early in your training. That said, throughout our training and continuing education, the focus is very much on medicine as a science, embraced by concepts of evidence-based medicine, delivery of the best proven interventions, and the adoption of new innovations and technologies all have enormous impact on morbidity, mortality, and quality of life. As welcome as these may be, don't allow them to diminish the inherently subjective relationships you will have with your patients, your colleagues, and your, your trainees. Not all decisions we, that you will make are amenable to rigorous study des design. There are still there's still plenty of room for empiricism, cultural sensitivity, effective communication has already been mentioned, and thinking out of the box. Now, I know that MSIH has taught you these things, but make these a continued learning experience and hone your skills as an artist. Now, I'd like, I just in closing, would like to share a story with you that really shaped my career, but also myself as a person and may illustrate what you, some of the experiences you may have to look forward to. So you know, soon after I finished my training, I joined the Department of Pediatrics at McGill. And, th and th this followed a fellowship in child development and pediatric re rehabilitation. Those, are, those were kind of rather unusual in those days. But given this training, I was assigned as the chief pediatrician of a pavilion housing children with severe neuromotor disabilities who had been abandoned by their families. In nearly all cases, on the recommendation of the physician, their physician in those days, that thankfully not something that happens anymore. The pavilion was really run down, peeling paint. Uh, it, it was a former TB sanitarium that had been converted into a pedi had been converted into a pediatric permanent care facility located in one of the poorest uh, communities in Canada. The children housed in this facility were a mix of neuromotor disabilities that left them disfigured, often incontinent, uh, in many cases unable to communicate, and in most cases profoundly dependent upon staff for their daily hygiene and care. I was, to put it mildly, it was, to put it mildly, a very disturbing place. There were three wards, and twice a week, I would round on each of these wards, which given the smells, the sounds, and the sights, I carried out as rapidly as I possibly could. Extending perhaps cursory good morning greetings to the children as I passed from bed to bed, but with little expectation of much in, in return. This was the case with one young lady, Jocelyn. a teenage girl with severe cerebral palsy and, a very, and very disfigured as a result. About six months of these daily, or twice, three times a week, 
sessions where I'd go by these beds saying good morning, good morning, good morning uh, to Jocelyn. I would stop by a nurse while I was at Jocelyn's bedside to answer a few questions. And about one minute into our conversation, I heard behind me, good morning, Dr. Larson. To my astonishment, it was Jocelyn speaking. I was both shocked and embarrassed that over all those months, my preconceived assumptions about the magnitude of her disabilities and my rapid pace through rounds had denied her the opportunity to present herself as anyone other than an abandoned, retarded, pathetic individual. How frustrating for her. After that episode, I made the decision to slow down and give each child a bit more of my time and attention. In time, I came to know many of these children as individuals, not just a clinical disorder. It wasn't long after that that one morning when I approached Jocelyn's bed, my very first impression was, what a beautiful face she had. That was a real wow moment for me. Jocelyn and others in the pavilion taught me many things, but two stand out. First, the beauty that can be found in us all, if only we take the time to look. And second, all those, all those we encounter in our privileged position as doctors deserve our respect, the right to be treated with dignity, and the opportunity to express their lives better. This is the case where they're dealing with patients, a family, a colleague, or even, even a, a community. So as you move forward in your careers, all of you will encounter your own Jocelyn's. Anticipate them, embrace the opportunities they present, and allow them to shape your careers and the pathways you choose to follow. You have great futures ahead of you for which I wish you all the very best. Do good, have fun, keep dreaming, and never lose your vision, whatever it may be. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Larson. Now for the formalities. I'd like to invite Vice Rector Aronson Danielle to read the formal wording of the diploma. Students, please rise. I hereby declare that you have completed your studies and successfully fulfilled all the necessary requirements in accordance with Ben Gurion University's constitution and bylaws. And based on your achievements and on the recommendations of the Council of the Faculty of Health Sciences, the Senate of Ben Gurion University of the Negev confers upon you this day, Wednesday, May 24th, 2017, the degree of Doctor of Medicine. Congratulations. You may sit down now. I would like to invite Professor Carmi, Professor Limor Arnson Daniel, and Professor Shiner to present the MD diplomas to the graduates. Please. And I invite Dr. Clarfield to read the names of the graduates in alphabetical order. Just while they're getting organized, I spend a lot of time and energy studying your names and making sure I pronounce them right. Any mistakes that are made this evening are the responsibility of Hanna Glinter <laughs> and, jo and Jonah Kroniski, who coached me tonight, this afternoon. I'm just waiting. Tell me when you're ready, uh, Lior. We're all set? Okay, we're all set. Charlotte Lynn Campbell Alexander. Oh, 
don't do that to me. I didn't see this. <laughs> Jamie Barnes. I saw the Jamie. Now I get it. Okay. Virginia Faulkner Byron. Morgan Klon. They're not doctors till they get their diplomas. Sorry. Dr. Charlotte, Dr. Jamie, Dr. Virginia, Dr. Morgan. I don't, I, I, I'm going to have to lower my salary. <laughs> Who's next? I can't see that. Aaron? Dr. Aaron Doby. <laughs> Dr. Joanna Edwards. Dr. Jennifer Eitingon. <laughs> Dr. Jodi Azrati. <laughs> Dr. Reva Frankel. Dr. Hanna Glinter. <laughs> Dr. Jody Grundman. Dr. Christy Hadley. <laughs> Dr. Asaf Harris. Dr. Bela Lidwak Harris. And don't flick his hand away. I'm going to give this a second before I call. A picture. Take a little half second. Dr. Aaron Leib Herzog. <laughs> Dr. Seth Ari Simpson Hoffman. Dr. Jonah Kroniski. <laughs> Dr. Joshua Kugler.
Dr. Rebecca Lapham. Dr. Grace Yoon Jin Lee. <laughs> Dr. Esther Young Ju Lee. Dr. Max Migliori. <laughs> Dr. Elon Richman. Dr. Amit Ringel. Dr. Dove Rosenbaum. Dr. Janie Shadlin. Dr. Moshe Stiebel. Dr. Eric Matthew Sue. Dr. Alex Wang. Dr. Yudi Weiss. Dr. Brittany Ray Weissman. Dr. Elizabeth Joy Weiser. And last but not least, Dr. Xiao Chuan Yang. Thank you, Professors Carmi, Aronson, Daniel, Shiner, and Clarfield. Um, not many people know this, but I think that's something like 550 graduates that have now come out of this school. Is that correct? About 550? It now gives me great pleasure to call upon Dr. Esther Lee, who was chosen by our classmates to make the student valedictory address. friends, family, colleagues, and mentors. I'm here today on the behalf of the graduating class of 2017 to share our story, to let you into the journey of our last four years. And I'm honored by the privilege to be able to stand here. 
When we first arrived, we were full of unbridled energy and naive vision. We were fresh from the Peace Corps, undergraduate, graduate degrees, research, interning, volunteering, traveling, and we came with a passion yet to be tempered, honed with time and hard experience. Some of us returned home in a sense. The Friday night Shabbat dinners and rituals tasted all too familiar. And the Hebrew of Hebrew school was not just homework anymore, it was a tongue of our own. We left family to return to a certain homeland. But many of us were also strangers in coming to this land. We were foreigners and aliens and alone in a marathon that we call a career in medicine. We looked different and we had accents and we experienced life far removed from this country before coming here. And though we are not any less foreign or alien now than we were four years ago, we are so much less alone in taking on this mountain weight of being MDs. I came to Israel for the first time four years ago in the summer of 2013. I had just graduated from upstate New York and spent my childhood in the southern Philippines. I thought I was prepared for every extreme. (laughs) But like most theoretical conclusions about the future, it quickly dissipated in the face of reality. On top of rigorous training grounds, first textbook learning, then clinical medicine, was the added bonus of life in Israel life here in Beersheba. The language mishaps, buying a wrong kind of cheese or sour cream, (laughs) week-long holidays where everything shuts down, Shabbat dinners with our professor's families, and of course adopting cats. (laughs) The glow of a new country soon wore off, and the studies of medical school designed to prepare us for working with patients felt at times far removed from the real practice of medicine. The cadavers we studied human anatomy on were still just that, just stand-ins for the warm, living bodies that we will soon have the privilege to take care of. In my reflections in preparing for the speech, I thought about how easy it is to lose hope in the face of mountains beyond mountains. Not just a lifetime of board exams and recertifications, but also potential lawsuits, ethical dilemmas of life and death, juggling a demanding career and family, also the mountains within. We will ask ourselves, again, why we chose this. Yes, we did choose this. (laughs) And and if it is worth it all. Human suffering is not an easy question, and, and as physicians, We have been handed the ancient role of entering in and walking with the vulnerability brought on by living in human bodies to not just diagnose and treat and prescribe, but to also encourage healing in whatever form that might need to be in. Not just to give factual news, i.e. the prognosis is bad, but to also plant a sustainable hope. We will face this together. And as medical students, we face the academics of diagnosing the sick but we were shielded from the full force of responsibility of working within suffering. As we step into our own careers, may we do so with both courage and frailty, knowing that to see ourselves in the patient is the key to healing. Because connection is not about race or skin color, religious affiliation, or even language. Look at us, even in our, my limited Hebrew, Most of us had had those encounters that we couldn't help but thinking or worrying about for days. For me, it was a Thai worker with infective endocarditis who taught me that to stumble through a broken dialogue every day despite little language ability was not wasted time. He showed me that caring is sometimes achieved best without words. We know this journey was not made alone. Thank you to everyone who came out tonight to pause reflect, and celebrate the achievement of graduating from medical school. To our administration and staff for the vigorous support and encouragement in our endeavors in the past, present, and also in the future. To our dearest family who traveled miles to be here tonight, we would not be here without you. You entrusted us to medical school in this crazy country and you supported us as we chose to stay here. (laughs) Finally, to the class of 2017, thank you 
for instilling within me a hope and anticipation for our careers as doctors and healers. May we take with us the resiliency of medical school in Beersheba, the humor that we needed to survive, and the understanding of being foreign and strange to meet those other strangers in medical need. May we give ourselves the same measure of hope that we grant our patients. May we bring whole healing, not just physical, but emotional and mental, and perhaps even spiritual. May we be agents of change, striving to bring restoration to all parts of health, not just what we encounter in the hospital. Lastly, may we be wise stewards of the time and the dedication and training we've received over the years. You have become my family and will always be my family, no matter how spread apart we will be. You have turned this desert into a home, and for that, I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Prior to concluding, it is customary for our school to present some special awards. I call upon Associate Director of Student Affairs, Dr. Asher Moser, to join me on the stage. We do have a, special, a few special awards for some of our outstanding graduates. First, I would like to introduce the Carmi Margolis Award for Clinical Excellence. Professor Margolis, did he come in tonight? Did Carmi come tonight? Where is he? Didn't come tonight. So, Mr. Clarfield, Professor Clarfield, would you do the honors of standing by me while I read the, the, the award? <laughs> this award is given for the fifth time for the graduating student who has been noted once and again for his or her unique clinical skills. The criteria on which the award is granted here, based on evaluations received from the receptors of the clinical clerkships and the clinical electives, both here and abroad. We also weigh in the OSCE exams that take place throughout the third year, the step two of the USMLE, which is the clinical knowledge and skills, as well as cross-evaluation of the class as reflected in the Gold Humanism Honor Society questionnaire, which I will come back shortly. I'm a pediatrician, you can <laughs> cry. <laughs> Amongst the graduating class this year, we had several excellent and outstanding candidates for this award. After many deliberations, we have decided that this year's recipient is a fine person who received his CPR certification in his eighth grade. <laughs> Completed undergrad studies in economics and political science at Indiana University from Michigan. Please, Dr. Asaf Harris. He honored almost everything, maybe missed an Oscar here or two of here or there. <laughs> the second uh, issue I want to talk upon is the Gold Humanism Honor Society, otherwise known as GHHS. This is a U.S. national initiative of the Arnold P. Gold Foundation. The society honors medical students and physicians who demonstrate unusual commitment to service. Through a process of peers and faculty nomination, students are selected for demonstrating outstanding clinical abilities that are combined with compassion in caregiving, and we are delighted 
to announce that for the past year, they have already known this one year ago, the doctors Ringo, Weiser, Kugler, Shadlin, Byron, and Hadley. Would you please come up and receive your honors? Stand up. We want to take a group picture of you guys. I want to be sure that I'm actually giving the right person the right. This is just. That's actually, I need the. Okay, as they stand up for a photo opportunity. I'll read out the oath. The Gold Humanism Honor Society Oath. I pledge by all that I hold dear as a physician, I will care for my patients with compassion, respect, empathy, integrity, and clinical excellence. I will listen to my, my patients with my whole being. I will advocate for each patient as a unique individual. I will serve as a role model and mentor to promote humanism in healthcare. I will remember always the healing power of acts of caring, and I will dedicate myself to joining with others to make healthcare optimal for all. You must agree. <laughs> Thank you. It actually comes with a little check inside. It's not free. Um, now we go to the Sakal Kiev Celebration of Life in Medicine Award. This year, for the first time, we are starting a tradition. Dr. Sakal Kiev was a student of this school who passed away last year. We at MSIH knew him as Sakal, the kind, warm, confronting person and colleague who came from Cambodia to the U.S. with a unique wisdom and insight. He found the love of his life, and together, they, they had four children before embarking on his medical degree here. Their fifth child was born here. Sakal was always a figure of compassion and comfort for his classmates. He died just prior to graduation last year, and we were all humbly honored to present the certificate of his degree to his wife, Faith. In his honor, we have decided to create an award to be known as the Celebration of Life in Medicine. In collaboration with Faith, we put together the criteria which they, this award should be given to the student that most embodies in the eyes of their classmates the following characteristics that students should have, and they are the value of human life, living life to its fullest, joy in studying medicine, living life for more than oneself, and brightening the lives of those around them, which goes together with that beautiful speech we heard before. I'm very excited that Faith, Sakal's wife and mother of their five children, is here with us to share this moment. Once again, we had, thankfully, several excellent candidates. The person elected has had a long life passion for medicine and has observed an open heart surgery when she was only in grade five. She also exhibited care for friends and colleagues alike throughout her time here at MSIH. From Cambridge, Massachusetts, I would like to call upon Dr. Virginia Byron. You're allowed to cry. That's the least of it. Thank you, Faith. Thank you, Faith. Wait, wait. Wait, 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 wait. You have to say one more. Thank you. 
the fourth uh, award we want to acknowledge is the Richard Dickelbaum Award for Global Health Excellence. I know. <laughs> we at the Medical School for International Health have always held that the global health is basic, inseparable, and an integral part of medical education, as appears in our name carved by two of our founding fathers, Professor Margolis and Dekelbaum. As Professor Dekelbaum could not join us today, Professor Clarfield will again assist me in this honor. <laughs> this annual award is made in recognition of a student or students' immense contribution to the International Health Tract at MSIH. This year, recipients of the Richard Dekelbaum Award for Global Health Excellence are Drs. Janie Shadlin and Christy Hadley. Thank you, Dr. Moser. Almost there. I'd like to call, call, a, call upon Professor Alan Jodkiewicz, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, to announce this year's award for Outstanding Teacher. I would like to also may I add my congratulations to this amazing um, class for this outstanding achievement to be colleagues and doctors together with us. I also want to thank the staff, um, both in Beersheba and New York. This is all possible really just because of them. They do all the hard work. And also all our great teaching faculty um, who have dedication um, to teach everyone sitting here. As a representation of that teaching faculty, um, every year MSH gives a teaching award to a faculty member who shows dedication, um, excellence in teaching, and support of the program. And this year we'd like to give it to Dr. Ari Loudon, for years the um, coordinator of the psychiatry um, marechet um, system in MSH. Dr. Loudon, please. This award for excellence in teaching is presented to Dr. Lavin in recognition with deep appreciation for excellent and dedicated teaching at the MSA Medical School for International Health and Medicine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oops. Picture. Ari, picture. And now I call upon Dr. Clarfield to conclude our ceremony. I'm having a very, very, very busy evening. I would like, just for a moment, the staff to, as, as Alan said, as, as Professor Jodkwood said, I want, want you guys to stand up for a second, turn around so people can see you. All of you, please. Amit, Amit. I've worked in a lot of places, and I've worked with a lot of good teams, but I honestly can tell you that this group of people, led by Leora and mothered by Anat and everybody else, they really do all the heavy lifting. They're great, great people. They work together beautifully, and I, I can't remember having worked with a better, more together and uh, lovable and loving team of people. Thanks to all of you. Oh, I do that? Okay. All right. <laughs> Not very well trained, am I? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, st the class of 2070, please stand up. And with your right or left hand, depending on what side you are, pick up your kova, your hat, take it in your hand, and on the count of shalosh, toss it in the air. Echad, shtaim, shalosh.
Yeah. Last words. Yeah. Well, I think I think Professor Mark Clarfield really deserve a very big round of applause as well. Thank you very much. I call upon doctors Jody Israti, Eric Tsu, and Aaron Herzog to accompany us in singing our national anthem, Hatikva. Audience, please rise. sit down and the audience is requested to remain in place until the academic parade leaves the auditorium. Graduates, you may now leave the auditorium. Thank you all for coming and warm wishes to the class and to yourselves for continued success.